Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's episode. Secret of a metaphysical nature. Okay, um, sorry guys, had to set something up. All right, <clears throat> so pretty much secrets of a secret of a metaphysical nature. You see, this world opens up to us through language. That means after you have a sort of good control uh, and uh, mobility of your outer realms and your objective realms, then you begin wondering about the mind. So pretty much you play the games of the body until the mind comes into a sort of questioned framework. Now when the person wonders about the mind, the mind is what is moving language, concepts, and the attention. That means literally what is in our attention is our mind's activity. It is literally where our mind is positioned to receive. So you can say that the human sensory perception, at least for our visual senses, which is our, <clears throat> our primary focus for now, we got to see it to believe it. So it's like where your head is turned, you see the details of the truth that you see. So when a, question, when a human being wonders about what is beyond the physical, they enter the metaphysical, interactions that move beyond the human framework, you know, beyond the relationships of <clears throat> visibility. There is a Sufi mystic poet named uh, Rumi. He says you need to work in the invisible realms as, hard, as much as you need to work in the visible realms. That means there is two types of work. <clears throat> there is the work of the person's body, let us say, and let us say there is the work of the person's mind. Now, we tend to think both of these need to be in motion. You know, both of them have to be active. You know, we think of people's behavior and <clears throat> it is true that we have the term mindless. We say some people do mindless behavior. But usually we tend to see that everybody has a mind in motion. Now, it's about controlling this mind. You know how <clears throat> even the movie Matrix touched, up, touched on this, freeing the mind. With the mind is not something you can free. It's defining the freedom. So if the definer changes, then the definition can change. So, to wonder about metaphysics, <clears throat> we are wondering about something beyond our physical description. Now, I'm doing something very interesting in these talks, something that I feel a few traditional <clears throat> old-school archaic-minded people are kind of scolding me. And what that means is, uh, you, technically, you can't speak about the unseen. I noticed this early on. I noticed this from the moment I saw various quotes, whether from the Upanishads or from the poetry of the Sufis, you know, that silence and <clears throat> strangely inactivity seems to be the unknown. 
Because we define our knowledge based on what moves, you know? That means the verbs that the person knows, the, noun, the words, the vocabulary of the person, it comes, it arrives from motion. <clears throat> that means if somebody does a backflip in front of me, I can look at somebody else and be like, yo, did you see that backflip? Do you see? <clears throat> the activity needs to happen and then the words arise for it. So we can say that there is a level of unspeakable activity, then there is the human being of speech. It's been a while now. It's been like, what is it, like six years I've been trying to wonder what's going on with the human life. <clears throat> and my conclusions, some have changed, some have not changed from early on because they were validated. They were literally like, I felt something was invalid, you know, but yet my emotional state kind of followed it. Then I saw it was valid. So this is the thing, that human beings are in a very strange place. And when we accept normality, we descend into delusion. You see, there is no such thing as normal. Normal is like a childhood, it's like, it's like a childhood toy. You grow out of normality. <clears throat> Nothing is normal about this world. Everybody has a different DNA. Everybody's reception of the reality they perceive is different. You know, in a world where we're designed differently, even though certain design similarities, common species and whatnot, but like we are designed differently, we are trying to compare ourselves. For me, if we were all clones, yeah, then we could compete and compare and kind of build a civilization that way. But because everybody is different, to compare is actually fighting over stuff, <clears throat> the, uh, the expression of stuff. I think there's some people on this planet who are very wise and they realize it's not about <clears throat> a communication of a human being to a world. It's also how the world is communicating as the human being. You know, right now, it, it, it's kind of like a very playful situation for me. Because I can totally see that because there is something here moving, but materialism, material, the secular society has left no room for the person to build their own road. That means if there is a chance that the higher dimensions, it's not like a mountain, you just have to uh, climb, you got to build the mountain. <clears throat> it's like you got to build the ladder to get up there, do you know? If you have to build the ladder and you're in a mindset of looking for the ladder, you will never get to the higher dimensions. You see, it's about the responsibility for the expression and effort of the human being. That means sometimes I wonder, I ask myself kind of as if like I'm an employee of my own governance, of my own management. I wonder what will happen if I give 10% of my attention to something. What would happen if I give 50%? What would happen if I give 90%? I have tried it. You don't know how many ways... I have wondered about my eyes. <clears throat> After a point, you notice they turn into a field. Once they turn into a field, the knower becomes unconditional. Right now, people know things conditionally. What that means is we prepare. <laughs> <clears throat> Little did we know, improv was the Logos' voice. You see, nature knows itself. It's man who has just th a thought he has forgotten because he's new to the scene in one form. What if you are an incredibly multidimensional being, whoever you are listening to me, and this is one of your dimensions. Like right now, we don't see the brain, but we know we have a brain, you know? <clears throat> and could it be that right now, we don't see our higher dimensional existence and The interesting thing is, <coughs> the 
there is a huge chance if we were not indoctrinated with language, we would feel a complete uh, uh, reevaluation for it. You know, there's uh, <clears throat> there's this thing in certain societies, shamanic tribes, where it's it's a bit messed up when you look at it from a modern perspective. But I don't know, it was something they did, and what what it was was these primitive tribes. I don't know, in the Amazons or whatever, they would, in some sense, some of them had this weird tradition when the child was born. For 18 years, they would put the child in some cave. So till the age of 18, the child was raised in darkness, complete pitch black darkness, as if all the other senses developing except the sense of light, visuals. You know, as if like, as if like the, that tribe was like, all right, let's gift this kid with sight after he's 18. You know, and so that kid was living in the darkness of a cave in a restriction, not having a complaint, realizing it is okay to live in that hardship at a young age. Do you know? Then when the kid endures through the hardship, then the rest of life becomes easy. <clears throat> that means generals knew. They just had to get rid of the general of the other army and then the whole team would descend into chaos. This is why in a civilization where there is no honor, there can be really no true leadership. A civilization that wants more than it wants to give is a broken civilization. That means the only system that this system would work if everybody gives more than they take. That's it. If you give more than you take, then you don't, and nobody would have a conscience. You know, I mean, of course, you'd have a conscience based on what kind of activity you do as a human being. But I'm saying, like, <clears throat> there is something that if we can develop a win-win situation, if we can make our mistakes serve the civilization, do you know what that means? That means, I'll give you an example. If we can make meaningless moments meaningful, we have advanced the moment. It's as simple as that. In my um, youth, not my youth, maybe I was like 15 or something. <sighs> Pretty much I was in the school that had so much stairs, it was torture. Literally, it was like a workout every day. You know, students had to climb into a higher grades. And the, the, the thing is, uh, um, this, these stairs, like imagine six levels of stairs. What is that, like 32? Uh, Thirty-two times six? Uh... What is it like an like around 200 stairs and the younger you were you know the the harder the stairs were for you to climb you know and I thought years later after you know um, climbing those stairs <laughs> After, after climbing those stairs, I could tell you, I was like, holy shit, if there was some technology that the staircases could go down and it could generate power, there would have been endless power to that school. You know, that's really what we should care for, self-sustaining houses. You know, our homes right now <clears throat> are dependent on, their power is dependent on, you know,
their environment, but to make it house into a spaceship, that would be the greatest thing, I think. If our homes were spaceships and whenever there was like a tsunami, we'd be like, all right, time to move. You know, we'd just fly into the air. <clears throat> I mean, honestly, people don't realize how revolutionary hover technology would be, hovering technology. Imagine like you're just like a bench without legs hovering like two meters in the air and you're sitting on it. You know? <clears throat> Can you imagine, like, people sitting on these comfortable chairs, like one-person chairs, and the chairs hover in the air, and they're just, like, sitting on their couches, like, in the air. Couches are floating. People are just chilling in the neighborhood in the air, you know? <laughs> Like in India, They have these um, swing chairs. <sighs> Honestly, guys, what can I tell you? metaphysics is the other side to the coin of life where we're looking at how a mind <clears throat> is being the you know beginning movement of intelligence really this is what it is when we look at the effect of our intelligence the body is in the grave when I look at the cause of our intelligence the true nature of consciousness is unknown you know, we may be living at a time where it's, you know, I think every generation has had its hardship. You know, the cool thing about history is because you have a sort of recording of the past generations, you could be like, oh, okay, they had it worse than me. You know, I should probably relax with my suffering, you know. Honestly, a human being can't build anything without the unknown. You can't do anything new without the unknown. When the person realizes this, language changes. Your relationship with language changes. For me, metaphysics was direct experience. Physics was all being explained through indirect language. That means, really, there is nothing you can say about physical stuff. The stuff is itself. Anything man communicates, what man thinks is his accurate knowledge of the world, is like <clears throat> someone translating something with 30% accuracy and feeling it's 100% accurate. This realm is, uh, I mean, we've divided into the micro and the macro. That means you see, for example, a human being smoke a cigarette and then you see, for example, those uh, factory uh, pipelines, what do you, not pipelines, those factory kind of <coughs> towering kind of smoke chimneys or whatever, I don't know what you call them. It's like the, a factory is like the planet smoking a cigarette, you know. It's not good for it, <clears throat> yet it's what the current demand of the market desires.
if physics is known, metaphysics is unknown. If the visible is known, the invisible is unknown. If the singular is known, the multidimensional is unknown. Right now, the way <clears throat> I feel science is breaking up the dimensions of the realm is really, <clears throat> imagine dimension A and dimension B, and in dimension A, <clears throat> what does the person have? Let's say there is an apple pie. And instead of the person eating this apple pie, the person shatters this apple pie like glass, or I could say literally cuts it into different pieces. And let's say these shattered apple pie pieces uh, fall into different parts. They shatter all around the planet. Now the person <clears throat> has limited themselves to the multidimensionality of an inferior dimension. That means you can have a problem that's from this dimension and the answer is in this dimension, but you can have a problem that's not from this dimension and you could endlessly try to answer it from here. The answer is most likely unconditional. A lot of great mysteries of this realm, they have to do with uh, <clears throat> not circumstance. They have to do with a uniqueness to the moment story. The way I think I, or I would say as a human being I'm experiencing life, I think every person is like this.
<clears throat> Honestly, guys, I don't know how to say it. Just pretty much a sensitivity to uh, the whole moment. That means when I come to speak or pretty much when I wake up from the beginning of the day. It's as if all existence it appears to me, at least, <clears throat> as a room. And so in this room, different parts of it are moving. So if the person assumes they don't know anything or just doesn't pay, try to know and they just look at how they don't know, you will know a lot. If you look at how you don't know things, you instantly know them. So imagine you're uh, someone sitting in a room and everything that enters that room you're aware of. Now imagine your whole moment of being is like this spherical room you're in and different forces, different things, uh, elements, events happen through the day. You know, the imagination can be defined as a play, uh, as, a, as a state where Images are in the jurisdiction of uh, the viewer, but in front of our eyes, things don't occur in, a, in accordance to our own mind. That means the only reason I am speaking right now is because minds move differently. <clears throat> because if we were moving in the same way, what would there be to say? You know, the solution is not complete union that dissolves individualism, and it's not complete idol worship to a degree that we forget what it means to be collective. We have to quickly um, read the chapters of, our, of, of the human species' efforts, and <clears throat> after we read chapters completely, recognize we have completed a chapter and move on to the next chapter. When somebody reads a book, they don't just read one page, then turn the page, then turn, turn it, rewind, turn it back again and read the same page over and over again. You constantly move to the next page, to the next page, to the next page. <clears throat> and when I wake up, it's literally, life is like that, where in regards to the inner realms, it's like the sentences of a book. The moment I move, it's not like this. Like It's not just the words I'm saying here. Anytime I move, it generates language. <clears throat> it's just based on sight and stimulus. Nature is not um, something that could be calculated. It is where all calculations <clears throat> are left to interact. Terence McKenna used an incredible term in one of his talks. He said gene swarming. <clears throat> that means it's like a genetical effort. Nature cared to become a human being and light sculpted our free will by the result of, by the recognition of on, off, on, off. There was light, everything was visible, suddenly there was no light. People came to the darkness. Do you see how much of psychology, morality, it's all the battle of light and darkness. You know, the person was evil, the person felt disconnected with the realm. The person was good, they felt connected. And regardless of how they branded the moment as a story, I am telling you, the story surpasses brands. Right now we are living in a way where a thousand years, they're going to look back at 2020 and be like, oh gosh, how could they live like that? Do you know? <clears throat> We're not realizing the privilege we have. We will be in 2020, 
is like a year where an incredibly advanced being has the potential to be advanced, but it's not taking, it's not going forth. That's the thing. If we don't attempt the new, <clears throat> if we realize the past has as much solutions as it could see. Do you know in this life I have, I have read, uh, I could tell you a lot, a lot of uh, <clears throat> different religious uh, perspectives, but from the eyes of practically what did they mean to lifestyle. You see, when you want to know the human being, the human design, the only way you can get to know your designed intelligence is by implementing design, by designing. If the person decides that they will become a designer to their moment, their eyes will notice many things. And that's the thing about nature. <clears throat> Everybody can say anything, but it has its own geometry. From a theological standpoint, I wondered, <clears throat> you know, two things, two points. One, God created man, uh, and in many religious books, God is seen as forgiving. But God couldn't forgive Adam and Eve. Weird. Do you know? So that's one mystery, theological mystery. The other theological mystery, and theology is a, is a realm where we're, we are considering what if it was true. You know? <clears throat> and... From a theological standpoint, the second mystery would be, where did God make earth? It's a question for me. God made earth, but where? That means where is heaven and earth? Where are they made? Where are these structures of dimensions made? And I realize they are made in heaven. We are in heaven A state of balance <clears throat> in a moment a state of imbalance in a simulation for temporary beings life feels simulated for me I'm like wow how hilarious I wake up from a dream but I wake up every day so does that mean every day is technically a dream because I wake up the next day do you see what I mean Nature strangely silently knows, and it doesn't know <clears throat> comparatively. Comparison is for an individual object. Sometimes I feel like animals, they are not being moved by their separate minds. Do you know? Everything is made where truth was its own cause. And so the effect wasn't a burden. A human being who realizes that energy is where freedom comes from, and that we live our lives as personalities knowing there is an inevitable void somewhere <clears throat> planted in the stars that we may never see again or become really what is the decency of human living 
Like, is it a massive script? Is it a massive film? Is nature directing a movie and it's like, all right, I want these actors at this time and in this place and da-da-da-da-da. And who knew God is directing man's attention to how he is where everything is. We are not separate from the truth. We are the ocean wave that feels as the what's written on the shores is washed away, you know. It's a force. <clears throat> that means if they ask me, you know, guys, I, I think this is a very, very uh, interesting view that we're just a force. That means what if every person was their own law of nature? They were a natural being that was interpreting the laws of their realms in accordance to what they were familiar with. Because we have become too obsessed with information. We're a species that it, it, the mind of our civilization started wearing language like clothing. <clears throat> because when you really talk to people, it, depending on their eyes, how intensely they're holding their eyes, you can know they're lying or not. Because a lot of people don't know that uh, they think of strategy, but um, <clears throat> they don't think of the big picture. If this system was meaningless, perhaps it's an ultimate permission to generate meaning. That's the point. We reach suffering, we see enlightenment is possible. We reach enlightenment, we see suffering is possible. <laughs> A simple breath <clears throat> in a complex moment. The mind is not just here to administer the outer realms just so the person can survive. After the person survives, the mind wonders, why have I survived? And that's where intelligence really becomes part of your life as a human being. For me, I think there's no such thing as <clears throat> smart and stupid people. They're just people who are looking at the world. They have dared to look at the world as it is. And there's some people who will, they happen. And so after you see the world as it is, you reach a point where you're like, what else could it be? And you come back to novelty station. <clears throat> so what it is, is that you, it, like, you might not believe it, but there's this word called Googleplex in science. It's an incredibly large number. <clears throat> Googleplex. I think it's the biggest number. The biggest number is called a Googleplex, I think. Or I could be wrong, there could be more, but I think somebody named it. And the person who named that term Googleplex, <clears throat> he went to his grandson and asked him, what would you call the biggest number? And the grandson's like, Googleplex, you know? 
And then the the person, the grand, the grandfather was like, "Holy shit, that's a good name, kid." You know, and so the term became Googleplex, and it got somehow etched into <clears throat> onto the history on his history's walls. You know, so it was as if a young child had in as much spontaneous innovation as in some sense, an old man trying to come up with a new thing. You see, we don't realize there is <clears throat> two types of virtue where the virtue of the innocent who have never seen something happen, and then the virtue of the person who, after their innocence, you can say after their, uh, they, they were innocent, then they experienced the battlefield. They are no longer innocent, and so they're living with that more uh, denser, packed meaning to life. Do you know what? It's like when a person makes a couple mistakes, it is true that there comes an archetypal despair. That means the mind is like, what the hell? I'm trying all these archetypes out. Why isn't it working? Do you know, when it comes to that, the person tends to doubt themselves and they tend to play language games with their energy. <clears throat> the way I treat it is that I treat everything alive because I want to stay alive, guys. I'm treating. <laughs> My strategy is, is I, I have in some sense come to this noticing that life is simple and it's here as Rumi says out beyond ideas of right doing and wrong doing there is a place I will meet you there and when the soul sits on that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Guys, I think it's going to rain. I'm going to head inside. Uh, I's going to end the talk here. Thanks for who's, whoever's listened. Um, I'm, I'm not going to end the live stream though so i'm going to share the discord um if people would like to So guys, yes, yeah, somebody <clears throat> trying said Google is one with 100 zeros in base 10. Google Plex is 10 to the Google. Maybe I, I would say I would be curious to know if it's the largest unit, maybe. There was something about it. Let me just Google this, guys. There was something significant about the word. <clears throat> All right, Google Plex is... Um, Oh my god, it's Google's headquarters is called Googleplex. That's hilarious. Okay, well <laughs> There we go. Let me read its history. In 1920, Edward Kasner's nine-year-old nephew, Milton Sirota, coined the term Google, which is 10 to the 100, then proposed the further term Googleplex to be one followed by writing zeros until you get tired. No, dude, you, whoever said it is wrong. What's his name? Um, Trin, you're wrong. You're wrong, bro. <laughs> you lose this game, bro. You lose this game. <laughs> Trying, don't don't retract your statement, bro. It's good it's good fun for the chat section, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> In 
anyways guys uh, I got out inside I, I, I think I saw lightning I think uh, uh, Zeus wants to give a talk so I'll, I'll head inside um, <clears throat> thanks for whoever's listened um, I shared the discord links I'll see you whoever wants to continue philosoph philosophical discussion I'll be in the discord server in a few minutes thanks for listening blessings